Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Um, I'm very embarrassed and humbled by the, that introduction, and uh, <clears throat> I guess I just hope that I can deliver the message that um, was delivered to me, the way that it was delivered to me, the way that um, it's been outlined in this book, Alcoholics Anonymous, the book that um, lots of people had to lose their lives. In order for 100 people to come together to find a way um, that they can agree on and write down so we can carry this message to people as and when they come into our fellowship in order to recover in the same way that 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 I did. And I guess that the, the task for me and the difficult part of this process, this speaking process is to be able to do that in such a way where I tell you my experience without deviating away from what Alcoholics Anonymous would have me say. <clears throat> we've, uh, we've known each other a very short amount of time, Rachel, but you know that I like to talk. Um, but what happens is I go off in these tangents where I talk so much about my own life that I forget that I'm here for an actual purpose. And um, I guess that purpose is explained by Baz Six Days, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> David from Mark House, 43 days, Michelle, 48 days, yourself, Rachel, 59 days, uh, Lydia, 61 days. So I'd be interested in finding out, you know, afterwards, what was your experience whenever you walked into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous? Was it equal to mine? I hope not, because mine was terrible. Um, you know, so if there's anybody here tonight who's new and they're hoping to find the answer from me, what I will say is whenever I'm talking about what it says in the book Alcoholics Anonymous, you can rely on that stuff. Whenever I'm talking about what's going on in my life, some of it might be interesting, some of it might not. Some of it might be entertaining, some of it might not. The... Uh, the confusion that I find myself in um, at the early stages of Alcoholics Anonymous, just like just like you, Baz, I find my way into here through a treatment center. I was um, at the stage of my drinking where I couldn't stop, and I mean physically couldn't stop. Whenever I withdrew alcohol from the system, um, my heart was going into cardiac arrest, so I had to be withdrawn from alcohol under medical supervision. <coughs> Excuse me. And it was in that treatment center that I was introduced to AA meetings because they also hosted an AA meeting for the local village. But it's also where I picked up an awful lot of lingo. Like, uh, you're never going to recover. That the way that this thing works is you fight alcohol one day at a time for the rest of your life. Now, I don't know how you're programmed, but that sounded like a pretty bad deal to me. It sounded like a terrible deal to me. Let me put this in the context. Um, I drunk myself into absolute oblivion up until the age of 42 years of age. I've been drinking solidly for 30 years. I got myself into all sorts of scrapes, all sorts of trouble. If you want to hear about those scrapes and stories, call me afterwards. Some of them are really funny, actually, and tragic in, in equal measure. Um, I had lost my relationship with my children who I adore. Um, my marriage was falling apart. My business was on its knees. I just needed to do anything. And then I'm still getting a little bit picky about this whole fighting alcohol one day at a time thing. It just sounded a bit rubbish. It, it didn't really, <clears throat> I guess, I avoided AA because you guys do that whole spiritual thing, right? Which I didn't want to do because that's all about God and all that nonsense. Um, so whenever I finally conceded and going to have to do the AA thing, I thought you were going to give me a God type spiritual answer. Like miracles and all that stuff. But that's not what I got in this treatment center anyway. So we'll come on to the AA experience in a minute. They were telling me I would never recover and have to fight it one day at a time. That I wake up in the morning and I pray to this God that I'm refusing to believe in 
for a sober day. And at the end of the day, I fall under my pillow and I thank that God for letting me survive another day without taking a drink. Have you been doing that for 30 years, John Fraser? Every day? Because that sounds like a terrible deal. I know you well, John. Congratulations. And I know that you don't do that every day because that would be madness. The, the, <laughs> the part within me that still wanted life to be remarkable was not prepared to accept that as being a reasonable outcome. If I had to sort of buy into this whole God thing, then I wanted miracles. <laughs> I, wanted, I wanted the most incredible things to happen right in front of my eyes. If I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it all. And I want razzmatazz, I want carnivals, and I want fireworks going off. And I want to see the power of God passing through other people. So I knew that that would be okay once it got to AA, though these are just these treatment center fellas. They didn't understand any of that. So it's just a matter of walking into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. And at that point, I would be given all of this wonderful guidance and godly intervention and so on. Well, here's the thing. It kind of got worse whenever I went into the rooms of AA, right? Because I went into the, the first meeting, and I'll not say which one it is, because there might be some people here that are members of that group, and they're all really lovely people trying to help me. But they read from page 58 in the book Alcoholics Anonymous. Lots of meetings read from it, right? And it says, rarely have we seen a person failed who has thoroughly followed our path. So I looked around me, and I'm looking at these people, going, well, which one? That guy's path? Or, okay. And then it goes on to talk about something about being honest, which I wasn't going to do because I find it easier to lie. So I don't really do the honesty thing. I don't know how to do. Then it goes on for to say, our stories disclose in a general way what we used to be like, what happened and what we're like now. If you have decided you want what we have and are willing to go to any length to get it, then you're ready to take certain steps. So, then these guys went on to talk about how terrible their life was, how the wife doesn't love them anymore, how their washing machine isn't working and the dog died and they're all helping each other through one day at a time and they're telling each other to keep coming back for reasons that are yet obscure and all this kind of... And I'm thinking, so if I decide that I want what these guys have and I'm willing to go to any lengths to get it, I can then do the steps... But what happens if I don't want what these guys have? What happens if what these guys have on offer is the last thing on the planet that I want? Then what does the AA experience mean for a guy like me? It just meant I went to the wrong meeting, I guess, the wrong group. So I went to other ones, and they all read from that same part of the book. Interestingly, it's like lots of pages in this book, but they seem to favor this one. But you see, the misunderstanding that I had is I thought whenever I said, are we and, and us, that it meant them in the rooms. But the alarming thing was in the meetings that I went to, so did they. They thought it meant them as well. They thought that what happened is they would go up and they would tell their story about what it used to be like, what happened, which was they went to meetings one day at a time and prayed for a sober day and God gave it to them. And thank God I made it through another day. And that's what it was like now, that that would be something that would be presented as being attractive to the alcoholic. I seen they had the traditions in the wall and that one that talked about attraction rather than promotion. And right, okay, I, I don't know what attraction is meant to mean, but that that's not working for me. So I I, I struggle whenever I hear things like um those who come into AA and don't get it are people who didn't try hard enough. Or if they go back out again, it's okay. It's a revolving door. They'll come back in again. Because I see a lot of people going back out and not coming back in again. Rachel, I hear people say things like, the reason why I went out is because Alcoholics Anonymous didn't work. And the tragedy is that they're right. It didn't work. Now, I know that Alcoholics Anonymous, because Alcoholics Anonymous isn't those meetings. Those meetings are a manifestation of a book that was written, which actually is Alcoholics Anonymous, or at least they ought to have been. 
it does work and it never fails. There's guarantees within this book. There's various points within the book that gives staggeringly detailed guarantees as to what's going to happen and the precise time and around how that's going to happen for those who follow it. So that doesn't fail. But whenever I've heard people say, oh, went to AA, AA doesn't work. I can't tell that person that what they're saying isn't accurate because it did not work for them. What was being presented as being Alcoholics Anonymous to those individuals was at best mediocrity, at best. That today is the day you might drink, but you better be careful. Pray to your God. Like, I was new to the whole God thing. I've been doing it for a wee while now. I quite like it. But back then, I was really new to it. And I kind of thought, right, okay, does this God thing work on the basis that God only loves you for a day? Tomorrow, he might not love you so much. You know, things like asking for a sober day. I don't know about your God, um, but mine's really clever. I know yours is really smart, Vinny. We've talked about this. My God knows that I don't need to drink alcohol, that that's a terrible idea for me. My God knows that. I don't need to say that every day and, and live in this constant perpetual fear that today might be the day that I fall out of the favor of the God who knows nothing but abundance and joy. Like, well, what is that? So, you know, this start off with a wee bit of negativity, but, you know, I need to tell you my story. Like, that, that's the truth of what happened. The truth of what happened is I found Alcoholics Anonymous disappointing. And I only say disappointing because Tamara says I'm not allowed to use swear words. Um, so I find it, like, dismal, dark, depressing, and not offering me anything that I want. The people who were asking me to follow their example did not demonstrate that they were living the life that I wanted to live. They did not demonstrate that they were basking in the glory of the miracle that I needed in order to recover from alcoholism. So after trotting around a couple of weeks in, I stumbled upon a guy who was, you know, he shouldn't have been there anyway. He was meant to be somewhere else. He happened to be here uh, or at this meeting this one night, quite close to where I live. And he talked about something really ugly. So see, whenever we talk about attraction rather than promotion, I sometimes think we need to make it glitzy and pretty and be nice to the newcomer and make it all lovely. This guy was having none of that. He attracted me in a completely different way, in a way that a magnet attracts another magnet. Because he understood what that tradition means. He understands what it means in uh, chapter seven of our book. And he spoke to me like I was a newcomer because I was a newcomer. And the guidance that's in the book as to how you do that is exactly what he said to me. It's only later on afterwards, and after I got that part of the book, I thought that guy was cheating. He just copied what he said in this book. Turns out that's all he ever does in AA meetings. But what he did is he impressed upon me the hopeless of, hopelessness of my condition. He reinforced the spiritual experience that was already happening from the ego deflation that happened before I walked into the room. His job is not to deflate my ego. Nobody's job is to deflate my ego. That is the job of alcohol and alcohol alone. And that part of the job is already done. His job was to impress upon me the hopelessness of my condition by relating, relating um, my experience to his or his experience to mine. Talking about what happened to him. How difficult his life became how he had a spiritual awakening as the, the result of working the 12 steps, precisely as are outlined in the book Alcoholics Anonymous. And as a result of doing that, that he leads a remarkable life where he finds it easy to not drink alcohol. And if he signed up for just the not drinking alcohol bit, he would have done it. But he finds there's abundance flying from every direction all of the time. And he just can't believe how amazing his life has become. He has a great life with his family who adore him. He's a great career. And, you know, inside he's more than inwardly reorganized. There's something else happening. As and when his roots continue to grasp new soil. He didn't say all of that. It had a few bits on for dramatic effect. But the point being, he talked about this wonderful outcome from Alcoholics Anonymous, the program. 
but it began with just telling me how screwed I am. Are we okay with the word screwed? Because because it was. I was. I was in really bad shape. There was no way out from the place that I'd been to. I tried to find all the ways out. Any money I'd left, I'd spent on trying to find a way out. There was people with PhDs and white coats, you know, those little cool things to hold your pens and their jackets. Look really. These guys look really smart, and they could not help me. And this bozo was a guy who used to drink like I did. But I was so attracted to him. I was so attracted to him, I couldn't take my eyes off him. I could not avert his gaze. And every time he spoke and everything that he said spoke to me that he is a man with, with a real answer. It shouted at me that he was a man with a real answer, not just in his words, but in his whole deportment. Everything about him said to me, that's the answer over there from that guy. Why is everybody else giving him dirty looks for telling me the truth? That's another story, but I want what that guy has. And I don't mean I want his wife on his car and his job. I didn't want any of those things, all of which are amazing, by the way. But um, his wife's a good friend of mine now, so she won't be offended by that. But the point that I'm making is I, I didn't want those things as such, but I wanted the abundance that that man felt every day, the joy that he felt from the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. Whenever I heard about God before, because I never did the God thing, I heard it as being this pretty cosmic supernatural, awesome, amazing, massive thing. And he was the first guy who spoke like that. And he spoke like that as being the manifestation, the consequence, the result of one thing and one thing only. And it looks a bit like that. A book called Alcoholics Anonymous. Now the fellowship and the meetings and all those other pe- things, and you know, all good, all good. All there to, to support people while the work through the 12 step program as outlined in the book Alcoholics Anonymous, the only place where the steps are to be found. There is nowhere else that the steps can be found. Nowhere. So I started working through the program with that guy the next day. He asked me um, if, if he could take me through the steps and he offered to take me through the next morning, like really early in the morning. And um, I said to him, well, yeah, that sounds good, but I'm, I'm busy tomorrow morning. And he says, well, just cancel what you're doing then. I thought, oh my God, this guy's a bit full on for me, but whatever, we'll give it a go. Um, but that's where it all began for me. Like, that, you know, it, that's where things really, really, really started to change. This is where realization started to happen. Like we started from the from the title page. And then at the very, very early stages in the book, there's an invitation to work through the personal stories at the back of the book. Um, looking at them from three different angles. You know, it, it gives instructions for to do that at the bottom of uh, XII, at the end of the preface. So that was my homework, bloody homework and everything. I didn't do homework, I'm too lazy. But anyway, I had homework to do. And he had me do the set-aside prayer. It was a much shorter one than the one that you guys used at the start of the meeting, but nonetheless, it was the same gist, where it was to forget everything that I think I know, but it started off with God and it ended with amen. So in, in my first book, you see where I've just scribbled that bit out where I wasn't going to say God or, or amen because it sounded too religious. Um, so I was rebelling like mad against this thing, but yet being so incredibly attracted to it, being pulled in to this aura that was coming off this human being that seemed to be casting something that was bigger than him. Excuse me. So... Whenever we're working through the doctor's opinion, the realization I have a physical allergy to alcohol. And uh, for you guys here and you're around, I wish I had more time to talk about that because it's mind blowing. Anyway, my body's just as sick as my head and my head's pretty sick. So the realization of why it is whenever I go out for a couple of drinks and then I cannot stop no matter how much I try for that to be explained was amazing. And then it goes on to talk about more reasons why that causes me problems. Uses words like doomed bad news you know like really bad news like in fact at one point it goes into this big rant in the doctor's opinion and thought oh my goodness this is just absolutely painful let me just read this bit out of a me um so men and women drink essentially because of like the effect produced by alcohol that was great because other people said to me was things like well it might be childhood trauma or tell me about your life with your mother and is that why you drink you're drinking to escape or you're drinking to get ahead you know and here it just says most people drink because they like it. <laughs> wow, it's brilliant. It's so much more straightforward. I can get that because that's why I did it. 
I, you know, I was going to say, has anybody here ever drank alcohol? What a ridiculous question. But you know, that feels really nice, right? Well, that's why I drank it. Um, the sensation was so elusive that why admit it injurious? You cannot, after time, differentiate the true from the false. To them, their alcoholic life is the only normal one. They're restless, irritable, discontented, unless they can, again, again, experience the sense of ease and comfort that comes at once by taking a few drinks. Drinks which to see others taken with impunity. So a guy like me has a physical allergy, takes a drink anyway, think it'll be okay this time. After they've succumbed to the desire again, as so many do, people like me, and a phenomenon of craving develops in the past through the well-known stages of a spree, emerging remorseful with a firm resolution not to drink again. This is repeated over and over, and unless this person can experience an entire psychic change, there's very little hope of his recovery. Now, what a miserable rant that is. What it basically says is a guy like me is four-letter word trouble. But then it takes a bit of a weird twist because it goes on to say, on the other hand, and strange as this may seem to those who do not understand, to people like me, once a psychic change has occurred and the very same person who seemed doomed, who had so many problems he despaired of ever solving them, suddenly finds himself easily able to control his desire for alcohol suddenly finds himself easily able to control his desire for alcohol. You see, this is where we're getting into conflict in my head, you see, because everybody else except this chap I was talking to was telling me that this is a battle every day that I must fight. And I need to bring in prayer in the morning just to get through that day, and it's tough to not drink. Don't ever drop your guard. You know, whenever you're not looking, somebody says something weird like, is it, I might get this wrong, your alcoholism's in the parking lot doing press-ups, getting stronger, waiting to get you, or some weird crap, I don't know, something like that. I, like, what? what is that? You know, of course, I visualize this little thing in my head that was alcoholism doing this little press-ups and whatever, you know, getting stronger to come and get me. Like, you know, but then I read this book and it says the opposite of that. It says it's going to be easy. Once I have the psychic change thing, of course, but the purpose of this book, I was told is to give me one of these psychic change things. So, so which is it? Is it difficult or is it easy? Because it can't be both. Somebody's lying to me here or somebody's mistaken and trying their best to tell me the truth and getting it pitifully wrong. Um, yeah, I think that's kinder than lying. But, you know, this is what the book says. You know, and then not far after that a few pages in you know after learning some more stuff about a mental obsession which is more bad news you know i've got this allergy and then i've got this thing that deliberately makes me take the allergen and pour it on top of the allergy because i'm a bit loopy in the head and i have this utter inability to leave it alone and there's nothing i can do about it there's no control over it i'm just doomed again Then it says there is a solution. Almost none of us like the self-search and the leveling of our pride and the confessions of shortcomings, which this process requires for a successful consummation. So there's a solution, but it's bad news too. The first 100 writers of this book, almost none of them liked it. For the benefit of the new people, I'm not going to tell you anything better. I hated working the 12 steps. I hated it with a vengeance. It was horrible. But I'm telling you that for a good reason, because whenever people said to me it was going to be easy, I knew the full extent of my problem didn't have an easy fix. I took comfort from people telling me it was difficult. Because I knew that by applying something that was difficult to it with the support of the people around me showing me how to do it, there's a better chance there's going to be an outcome that's going to be successful. But then it goes on to describe this spiritual um, experience thing. In the most profoundly beautiful way, the great fact is just this and nothing less. Then it has a colon. So it's like, you guys listen, you know, we're about to say something important is the way it's kind of written. That we have had deep and effective spiritual experiences which have revolutionized our whole attitude towards life, towards our fellows, and towards God's universe. <sighs> That's pretty big, isn't it? The central fact of our lives today is the absolute certainty that our creator has entered into our hearts and lives in a way which is indeed miraculous. 
is commands to accomplish those things for us which we could never do by ourselves. Right? See, that's a wee bit different to you need to get to a meeting one day at a time and fight through it and, you know, but we love you anyway. And if you didn't take a drink today, you're already winning. And, you know, don't be getting horny, angry, lonely, or tired, or whatever that thing is. You know, this is like, I think that's right, isn't it? But this, this is like so different to that. It's so different. It's not even close. Like this is the stuff of miracles. The absolute certainty that my creator's entered. In, in, it's not like, you know, you might get the odd hint now and again that God's kicking around somewhere. This is remarkable stuff. The absolute certainty that my creator's entered into my heart lives in a way that's miraculous. I wanted miracles, you see. So, Rachel, unless they're going to give me miracles, I'm pretty sure I would have lost interest quite quickly. But this is talking about miraculous. That's kind of like miracles, isn't it? So, I was interested at this point because that's what I needed. You know, the the story of um, Roland Hazard, who tried to get sober, and again, it's not uh, enough time and bandwidth to go into that in any great detail. <clears throat> You know, went to see the, the you know, the finest psychiatrist in the world, you know, Carl Jung, still renowned by many to be incredibly amazing. Didn't work out. And, you know, went to see him in Switzerland. On his way home, stopped off in Paris and had a couple of Swifties, and that was it. He was hammered again. Stopped off in Paris on his way home. He could give himself no satisfactory reason for that fall. He didn't phone home and realize his mother died in a car crash or something. He just fancied a drink and took one and ended up on, you know, that's after being treated by, one of the best minds that has ever lived for a year. And then he went back to this guy, you know, as you would, you probably paid him a few quid. I got to say, I can hear it hasn't worked. You know, what's the story? Um, and he was told that, you know, you're doomed. Get yourself a bodyguard lock. The point is you're doomed. But whenever he pressed him, you know, is, is there no other way? You know, tell me there's something. And of course we know from history that, um, um, that Young had been hanging out with William James and he knew a little bit about the variety of religious experience. And he talked about here and there, once in a while, alcoholics have what are called vital spiritual experiences. Now, you know, Hazard thought was a good, this was a good thing. He went to church and you go to church and you follow the prescription for this thing that would happen. Um, but it wasn't like that. It was described to him as being more of a here and there, once in a while kind of thing. You know, like being hit by lightning. You know, it doesn't really happen that often. But the net result of it is they appear in the nature of huge emotional displacements and rearrangements. Ideas, emotions, attitudes, which were once the guiding forces of the lives of these men are suddenly cast to one side and a completely new set of conceptions and motives begins to dominate them. Big talk again, miraculous stuff. You know, talking about this old life that's driven by emotion and the new life that isn't, but done in this miraculous way. And of course, what we now know is that the spiritual experience that, we, that we're talking about, although Jung wasn't aware of a recipe to create that, we do have a recipe to create that. We can cause lightning to be hit at any time for those who want to do it by following the, the prescription and the, the recipe and the guidelines in the book Alcoholics Anonymous. The net result being this remarkably massive thing, this incredible shift inside a human being. That just leaves everything so completely different to how it used to be. That, that, that didn't match what had been told. I think there's more of this. One proposition, we agnostics making reference to the personal stories, on one proposition, however, these men and women are strikingly agreed. Every one of them has gained access to and believes in a power greater than himself. This power, capitalized meaning God, has in each case accomplished the miraculous, the humanly impossible. Wow. Here are thousands of men and women, worldly indeed. They flatly declare that since they have come to believe in a power greater than themselves, to take a certain attitude to that power and do certain simple things, there have been a revolutionary change in their way of living and thinking. 
in the face of collapse and despair, in the face of the total failure of their human resources, they find that a new power, peace, happiness, and sense and direction flowed into them. Massive, massive stuff, massive outcomes. This happened soon after they wholeheartedly met a few simple requirements. Of course, none of this was handed to me in the plate to refer back to my previous comments about not particularly enjoying the 12 steps. But the net result of it is huge. It doesn't match this one day at a time, get by, pray for a sober day philosophy. It doesn't. And I can't, I've searched this book so, so, so many times. I can't find it there. It's not there. You know, I'll say it with absolute certainty. It is not there. And a couple of personal stories, it refers to maybe try and avoid alcohol for 24 hours while you're, you know, going through the steps and this kind of lingo that's maybe been blown out of proportion. I don't know the logic behind it. But you see, as I was working through we agnostics and the whole time I'm saying the set aside prior, the whole time the hopelessness in my condition has been reinforced. The, the state of pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization was starting a spiritual experience within me already. The ego deflation had begun. And whenever there's an ego deflation, certainly in my case, and I've witnessed it in many others, is that causes a vacuum that is filled by something that I can't describe. Some people nod in their head. You, you, you know, that's obviously not just an experience that I've had. Loads of people have had this thing, this vacuum this, that gets filled in. But as I'm going through the book, I'm starting to realize what it means to sense the nearness of my creator to get closer to this God, which isn't actually a movement closer to anything. It's the waking up to something that was already there. The understanding that the root of this problem or the, 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 is selfishness and self-centeredness, the root being the part under the, the plant pot, the bit you can't see, the, the tree's roots are underneath the ground. You can't see it. That's where the problem lies. It's not about treating the alcohol. It's not about treating the symptoms. It's not about doing the next right thing because guys like me can't seem to find a way to do the next right thing. It's about getting to the root of the problem, the selfishness and the self-centeredness. And I could wish to be moral and I could wish to be philosophically comforted. And I, I just can't live up to these things. But it says here with God's help that it's possible. As long as I start getting real with some very, very serious realities. This is the how and the why of it. Quit playing God, it didn't work. Stop doing what you're doing because you're terrible at it. And instead, the bottom of page 62 has me look at these three different roles. And I need to stop being the director of this play of life in which I find myself and do a really good job of being the actor. Rehearse my lines well, turn up on time, follow the instruction that the, the directors give me that comes in this weird thing called intuition that I've had to learn how to use. Do that instead. Be an agent of God. Be a spearhead of God's ever-advancing creation. That sounds lofty, doesn't it? Some rooms I go into and I call myself a recovered alcoholic, they go bananas. You should see whenever I say I'm a spearhead of God's ever-advancing creation. It's what it says. It's what I am. But it also says I need to stop being a father and be the child. But that doesn't mean act like an infant. It means I am the child of God. I am the son of God. And with that comes a birthright. I don't need to grovel for the crumbs that fell off Mags's table. It is my birthright to have absolute abundance in whatever form is appropriate. As the son of God, now, is that lofty enough terminology? Because that's what I needed to understand. And it's, take, it's took me years to understand that part of it. Because I'm here to talk about this word remarkable because, you know, whenever Tamara asked me to come up with a title, she said, come up with a snazzy title. And I was trying to come up with something that made me look clever, um, you know, which I failed to do miserably. But I just realized that I just want to talk more about what the program of Alcoholics Anonymous can give and has given to me. And I find it disgustingly easy to not drink alcohol. It's like, that's not even true because that implies there is an obstacle that I find it easy to overcome. There isn't even the obstacle. It's been taken away from me. And there was a time whenever I thought that was miraculous. 
Now it is because, you know, if it wasn't for God, I wouldn't have it. But is it still remarkable? Well, what does remarkable mean? Well, it means I wish to remark on it. So I might phone up John Fraser and say, John, I've got some news with you here. You won't believe this. I didn't take a drink today. He'd probably say, well, I've been doing that for 30 years. What are you telling me for? You've not got a more interesting story. You know, it does it stop becoming remarkable whenever I put down the drink for the last time? Top of page 63, when we took such a position, i.e. the position of the keystone, all sorts of remarkable things followed. We had a new employer being all powerful. He provided what we needed if we kept close to him and performed his work well. Now, there's a promise. That doesn't stand the bite, just hand it over and God will fix it. Says, you know, you need to stay close to him and perform his work well. Please don't misunderstand anything that I am saying. I don't think there's a free ride in Alcoholics Anonymous. I really don't. Um, those who know me know that I commit an awful lot of time and an awful lot of work to this daily. But I get something back from that. This two-way partnership agreement that is the third step prayer explains that, that I give these things and in exchange, I get these other things back. But the predecessor, the previous paragraphs to that talks about remarkable things coming to me. And time after time after time, we hear the ninth step promises read out in the rooms and I kind of avoid them because I'm just so bored of listening to them. But it doesn't mean they're not amazing. You know, the it may be because I read out so much, we maybe don't spot the remarkability of some of the wording. You know, we'll be amazed before we're halfway through. That's halfway through making the men's, just to be clear. But you guys all, all know that. We'll know a new freedom and a new happiness. What about that? The idea that I will intuitively know how to handle situations that used to baffle me. Like, that's a superpower. That's like Iron Man stuff, that is. You know, where I will intuitively know how to do things I previously didn't know how to do. I don't need to go and get books and study on it. I'll just get a wee bit of intuition and I'll know how to do it. Surely that can't be right. You know... (laughs) The bottom of page 84, the part that we refer to as the 10-step promises leaves no doubt as to where we are with the drink thing. It's not a thing. It's dealt with. There's a permanent solution that if you apply the program, you get it. Done. Not even sworn off, you know, without any effort, just comes. You know, it's like it's it's almost like I always say it as quite um, I'm not sure what the right word is, but it kind of just dances to you, you know, like, you know. Do you not get this? It's dealt with. You don't swear. It's like a miracle. You just bask in the glory of the miracle for the rest of your days. Be grateful for it, though. Off you go. And then go and find some other miraculous things to do. But the drink thing's now dealt with. It does not exist for us. It doesn't exist for me. It hasn't existed for a few years now. So what does that look like today? So I have not had a drink problem for years because the book Alcoholics Anonymous um, dealt with that. The book Alcoholics Anonymous was the vehicle to the God that dealt with that. Let me be clear. Um, what does that look like today? So I need to continue to ensure that the God who I'm certain has entered into my heart is my relationship with that God is the most important thing in my life. Bar nothing, bar nothing. I adore my children. They're not as important. Do not misunderstand that. And I hope I don't need to explain that. And if I do, you know, get yourself a sponsor. But the point is, in order for me to keep that relationship strong, I need to understand what that relationship is. It was not a case of going around churches and synagogues and mosques and interviewing the clergy to find out which of those faith systems is the right one for me. Now, I'm okay with all those faith systems. Don't get me wrong. The program of Alcoholics Anonymous explains to me that the God already exists deep down within me. And what I am to do is to awaken to that. And the process of awakening to that is the removal of blocks, blocks between me and the God that was already there. 
the common manifestations of self, you know, resentment, fears, matters to do with my sex conduct, the massive clear out, the making of amends, pain in the ass, but it's got to be done. Then what I need to do is to continue to get that right. So you imagine this beautiful, shiny, precious stone within me just covered in all the crap of the day and get that all cleaned up. What I need to do then is to continue to polish that and to keep that relationship strong. And I do that by looking out for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. When they crop up, not if, but when they crop up, because with a guy like me, they crop up dozens of times every day. There's a process on page 84 that would have me deal with that. I start off my day with the upon awakening process that's within the book. Whenever we talk about meditation in Alcoholics Anonymous, there are three meditations in the book. It's not the Eastern form of meditation, which I'm fine with. Um, if somebody wants to do that in addition to AA, that's great. But the AA meditation are the meditations that are on page 86. There's three of them. When we retire at night, which is a review of the 10 step stuff, although that is an 11 step instruction, it's a review of the 10 step information on awakening where I set myself up for the day. And then there's this one. And thinking about our day, we may face indecision. We may not be able to determine what course to take. Here we ask God for inspiration and intuitive thought or a decision. We relax and take it easy. It's the only time it says in the book to relax and take it easy. But at step 11, you're asking for intro. I don't know what to do today. Got this meeting coming up. I haven't a clue how I'm going to handle it. I had no idea how I was going to handle this tonight. So I went in and did this whole prayer, you know, do me a favor, God, and give me like some inspiration and shared a thought or decision. Hopefully won't say something to offend Vinny. Um, you know, give me the guidance that I need. And then I relax and take it easy and I log on hope for the best. A great way to live your life. Obviously, on the understanding that I stay close to him and I do his work well, I get to have this for free. I haven't paid anybody any money for any of this yet. And to buy one of these books. Um, but this is my life. Like, this is just something that's constantly given to me. You know, the staying close to God and doing his work well, though, his work is a kindness message to other people. And on the top of page 89, it says practical experience shows that nothing will so much ensure immunity from drinking as a tense of work with other alcoholics. I have immunity from drinking alcohol because I sponsor more than it is convenient. I'm immune to that. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that remarkable? So I've got this whole thing down. I've got these meditations in place. I've got this 10 step thing that I do. I sponsor people. I'm in service to the group. I'm like investing in all the things that Alcoholics Anonymous would have me invest. So what does that look like now? And it's interesting because the book gives us this little vantage point for a guy like me and a guy like my mate John and a guy like various other people who have the opportunity to look back. And on page 100, both you and the new man must walk day by day in the path of spiritual progress. So there's a qualification point. This is for the sponsors only. If you persist, remarkable things will happen. Let me get back to the meaning of remarkable. It has to be so significant. I feel I need to phone you up and say, wait to hear what happened today. It's remarkable. I wish to remark on it. If it's not significant enough for me to want to do that, then I'm bored. It needs to be that big for me. When we look back, so this is the vantage point of retrospect, we realize that the things which came to us when we put ourselves in God's hands were better than anything we could have planned. So the understanding is ours. It mustn't be something that I've planned. It's something where instead I've said, I don't know what to do. Give me the cheer of thought. Give me the decision. You know, take this from me. I'm going to do everything that it says to do in that bloody blue book that you told me to follow. But the rest of that stuff's on you. I can't handle it. Just, do it. Just deal with it. I can tell you now, without the shadow of doubt, Rachel, that whenever I look back, matters to do with relationships and sex, I couldn't handle it, give it away. And I don't know how the hell I've ended up with an outcome that's so amazingly remarkable in that regard. I didn't know how to parent my children anymore because our relationship was damaged and I was a sober guy and I didn't know how to do the sober thing, whatever. My relationship with my children is just so remarkable. I phone people most days to talk about it. It's so amazing. I can't even get my head around it. 
my business was on its knees. It was falling apart. And I wanted to go one direction. And my intuitive thought was telling me to go the other, the other direction. I wanted to take this course of, of action to try and fix the business. And my intuition was telling me that that's from a place of selfishness, from greed and dishonesty. You need to go this way. And the way that I was told to go by my intuitive thought was very frightening. Very frightening. But I followed the dictates of a higher power, which is defined as authoritative orders. I followed those. And I can tell you now that I cannot even believe what happened. I phone people up going, you'll never believe what happened in the business. I thought that was going to be a disaster. And not only did it happen, but the serendipitous nature of the timing and around the responses to what happened, the way the people were put in the right place at the right time and it all stacking up in the way that it did was miraculous. It was remarkable. It was staggering. It was stunning. But that's three examples off my top, of the top of my head for the many, many, many remarkable things that I get to witness and that I get to be part of. None of which are my doing except that the partnership of the third prayer explains that that is not an excuse for apathy. It's not an excuse for being passive. It's not an excuse for saying, oh, God will handle that. I invest heavily in what it says here. I do what it says to do here. I give it my all. I push myself in Alcoholics Anonymous to the point where my knuckles bleed. That's a huge exaggeration. And again, I'm being dramatic. But the point that I'm making is I commit to this the way that it says I ought to. And I get so heavily rewarded that whenever I hear newcomers being told things like, if you're not taking a drink today, you're already winning. Just keep coming back one bloody day at a time and pray for it. And all this other nonsense that we need to stop. We need to stop this. We need to knock it off. We need to invest in our traditions. We need to spend time going through our traditions and see what they really say, what they really mean. We see how the first tradition of unity actually means that we unify around the program of recovery, which is the book Alcoholics Anonymous, and that any deviation away from that with our own little cute little anecdotal crap that we tell people is actually not only harming that individual, but it's destroying Alcoholics Anonymous. So that whenever people say to me things like, I went to AA and it didn't work, I can't tell them they're wrong because they're right, because their perception of what AA is didn't work they're telling the truth it was never meant to be like that and uh, in the fourth of the second edition after talking about the 12 traditions i want to bring this word remarkable back in again at a more unified level it says this was the substance of aa's 12 traditions which are stated in full on page 561 of this book Though none of these principles had the force of rules or laws, they have become so widely accepted by 1950. They were confirmed by our first international conference at Cleveland. Today, the remarkable unity of AA is one of the greatest assets that our society has. I need to say that I don't agree with that. I agree that that was absolutely accurate at the time of writing in 1955. But today, the unity of Alcoholics Anonymous it is not remarkable. It is incredibly unremarkable. It is hugely disappointing. Why is it whenever I walk into an AA room somewhere else, I will hear a message? And then I go three streets away, I'll hear a different message. And then I'll hear a third message and a fourth message, all improvised by some people in a room who collectively feel that they have the right to do that because they don't understand our fourth tradition about autonomy because they don't understand our traditions and they don't invest in our traditions. I got four daughters, which is why I'm gray. Um, and they're getting older. My eldest is 18. I've one about to turn 15 quite soon as well. Is it probable that they will all have dodged the alcoholic bullet? I don't know. Let's say one of them has alcoholism. And doesn't want to come and talk to me about it because she's maybe a bit embarrassed and walks into a room of Alcoholics Anonymous. It is my job to make sure that the message that she gets and your son and daughter gets is the message, which is the message in Alcoholics Anonymous, which talks about a remarkable life. 
doesn't talk about this crappy little getting by one day at a time nonsense. It offers a carrot to those who look at this task of the 12 steps and think, oh my goodness, that's incredibly difficult. Any wonder these people balk because there's no incentive at the end of it that makes it worthwhile. So Rachel, Michelle, David, and Baz, with your few days, Lydia, I hope that I've said something tonight that has bore witness to the fact that the end of that process, which will be unpleasant and will support you through, but the end of that process is a life beyond your wildest dreams. My life is even not even remotely as good as I thought, or as, as sorry, is massively better. It's going the opposite way there. Is massively better than anything I thought it possibly could be. All it took was 12 steps, a bit of hard graft, sticking to what it says in the book, the love of a whole load of people who do this program and talk about it all the time. I surround myself with those people all the time now. But you know what? If it wasn't for the creator, who I'm absolutely certain has entered into my heart, none of that would have happened. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks very much for letting me come along tonight. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.